Okay. Let's check the audio here. It seems like it's a little, a little light. We'll just turn up the. This is an automatic adjustment. Okay, we should be fine. All right. So I have your test graded. I didn't bring them though because of my briefcase at home. Um, so I will have those for you. Um, seemed like across the board concepts, nomenclature, reactions, everything was fine. Um, the mechanisms are hard um, for everybody. So that you know is something to to work on, but that is also generally regarded by pretty much everybody as being the hardest part of OCAM. So it's not it's not the end of the world. Um, but if we can do better on that and get a little bit more focused, maybe on um, on getting at least at least some of the major steps, because even if you can't get the whole thing, getting you know the first two steps, or even if it's not the first two steps, just drawing the intermediates. Get you just get the intermediates right, and you can't show the arrows, the electrons moving. That's still enough for at least half credit. Um, so you know, yeah, it's more to to remember. And you do have to, if you're not going to draw the arrows, you kind of have to approach it in terms of memorizing. I don't know of a better way to remember the logic um, other than showing where the electrons go. But if that's if that's what it takes to get, you know, at least at least half credit on all those um, mechanism problems, then then that's better than than nothing. So um, and as always, having a a bad grade or a lower than desired grade in that test category just means there's room for improvement, right? So going forward, you have one, there's one category that has no points in it at your lab final that will start um, not next week, but the week after we'll start working on the synthesis project. Um, and so that's, that's going to make this the test category a little bit less painful as well because you'll have one more category to sort of soften the blow that's more of a um, take home final in terms of our final pro project rather than an exam. Um, so, um, like I said, I'll have those the tests to look to look at and we'll go through. Um, go through them on Tuesday then. Um, just again, sorry, I forgot. Just left my bag at home. Garbage day and the dog is sick and one thing leads to another and I left, left down my bag. So sorry. Um, so we're just going to finish out the chapter on, on carboxylic acid derivatives today. It might be a short lecture since I was planning on going through the, the tests. Um, that I then forgot at home. So we'll just go through this chapter where we talk about we talk about everything. Um, the last two functional groups for these acid derivatives are amides and nitriles. And so we'll talk about those reactions and then do some, some synthesis practice as well. And then I found a, a uh, pretty good, I've seen this joke before, um, but this was a pretty good one in terms of they, they actually labeled the rest of the periodic table. Usually when somebody makes this joke, they just replace all of the elements with carbon um, other than a few. Um, I always find these entertaining to uh, get chemists poking fun at other chemists. All right, here's where we left off the other day. This is the bottom half of that last slide. So this has us looking at esters and acids and um, predicting what product we're going to make here. And so the, 
and all of these, let's see, the first half of these are all reduction reactions. So then it just becomes a matter of figuring out where, where you stop the reduction, how far does it go? Um, so in this case, if we're dealing with lithium aluminum hydride, um, we know it's going to be what carbon is going to get reduced. And we know that these go all the way to the alcohol. So it's just a matter of do we have a hydride source or do we have a carbon source? Um, so for lithium aluminum hydride, we know that's a hydride source. So we're going to wind up with the carbon that I circled getting reduced all the way to the primary alcohol. And then you chop off the methanol as well. So we wind up with for A, We wind up with this one. We get methanol, and then we reduce that carbon all the way. Did we do these ones? We did some of these. Yeah. We do the top half or all of these. We did it all. We did all of them. Okay. That's I started looking and it seemed a lot more familiar. Well, there were there any of them that were particularly tricky that you wanted to to see again. Didn't realize we got through that whole slide. All right. Out of these, the trickiest ones are going to be the ring opening ones. And that's really just tricky in the sense that you have to keep track of how many carbons you have, right? Um, make sure you don't add or lose a carbon along the way. Um, there you go. Here's a better review one. Um, and I will also say regarding the uh, rank fees according to acidity, um, I did unintentionally ask a trick question on the on the midterm when it comes to number one and two on the most acidic. Part of the, the test, um, I did. I had them backwards in my own head based on the logic we've talked about. Um, so I didn't mark anybody down for mixing up one and two on on that part of the test. Uh, and Brenda, I have the test graded. I just left my bag at home. Okay. So I'll I'll we'll return them and go through the common mistakes on uh, Tuesday. But you have a grade at least. Awesome. And I, I will be here next week. Uh, what am I going to say? Okay, that's right. Yeah. We talked about that. Yeah. Um, then just to make sure you're not waiting forever to get a response, then I might just scan it and send it to you as a PDF um, okay. so you can, can go through it. Yeah. Is Rigney locked out or is that somebody just working on that? I don't see anyone. Okay. There's somebody working on a, putting in an outlet in the office that's right behind this wall. So that's probably what that is. Uh, yeah. At least he's not using the Dremel anymore. <laughs> All right, let's do, let's do some of these for practice and I'll split them up so I have room to draw on these. So again, for A, we've got a hydride source. So we're going to just start by converting the hydride source or converting that acid into a primary alcohol. You lose a water molecule and you make primary alcohol. If we start with the same molecule and we expose it to SOCl2. What does SOCl2 do? Uh, it makes 
What's that? Yeah, should make it into a chloride. We double check that from our handy reaction summary. Just to make sure there's no other aspects of this we're forgetting. Preparations for chlorides. Yeah, we take the acid, expose it to SOCl2, we just get the chlorides, just like we were expecting. So after step one, We get this molecule. Then we follow that up with excess dimethylamine. What's that going to do? Well, at the very basic, we just before we go straight to checking the reaction summary, we know that the nitrogen is a nucleophile, right? And we know that chlorine is a good leaving group, which is why the acid chlorides are so reactive. So when you expose an acid chloride to another nucleophile, you wind up with the chloride leaving as a leaving group and turning that into one of our other acid derivatives. In this case, we wind up with the uh, amide. Right, so after step two would be, we can confirm that by coming over here. If we have acid chloride, we expose the excess of any amine, um, and that the excess is really not necessary, but it's to drive the equilibrium forward. Um, we're going to wind up with making that amide, and it's either a primary, secondary, or tertiary amide, depending on how many things are attached to that part of that nitrogen. So we've already looked at this one. Kind of, except now we have the amide being exposed to SOCl2. So we might want to double check that. But at its most basic, we're probably going to be making an amide again. So the amides don't have anything called out specifically. But SO, the SOCl2 in general is just going to make it makes a good leaving group and um, we are likely going to just wind up turning that into a uh, another acid chloride, although we might wind up with some other might have asked that one out of order. Because my Ah, I did ask it out of order. So we, the SOCl2 made the oxygen a better leaving group when we when we looked at it from the from the first point of view. When it was an acid, we wound up making an intermediate where we we turned one of those oxygens into a really good leaving group, right? In this case, the SOCl2 still is going to turn it into a really, the oxygen into a really good leaving group. So this is actually how we convert back and forth between amides and nitriles because if you make if you take this molecule then you turn the oxygen into a good leaving group by having it react with the sulfur 
well, we're not trying to turn the, or the nitrogen doesn't get affected by that. And so since if the oxygen leaves and the nitrogen is still left behind, we're gonna wind up making this molecule. So again, apologies, this one's just slightly out of order. Ask this ahead of time. So we'll talk about that reaction in more detail in a minute. What about D? What happens after step one for D? Starting from an ester, we expose it to an acid. What do we get? We get a protonated, yeah, we get a protonated molecule. So intermediate wise, we're going up with an intermediate that looks like It looks like this, which means something like an alcohol or something like a water molecule could come in here. And attack there. So basically, this is a hydrolysis reaction. Acid, especially if it's written as H3O plus, is just going to turn the ester back into being an acid and an alcohol. So we're going to lop off that chunk right there to make the methanol and the carboxylic acid. So after one step, We get this molecule. And what type of molecule is this? What type of functional group is in this one? The one it's pointing to down here. It's not an acid, it's an acid chloride, right? So if we have a carboxylic acid reacting with the acid chloride, what are we going to make? And remember this is under basic conditions now. So, it's, so we don't actually have the acid once we go to step two. We have something with a negative charge. If it's a negative charge, what is it going to be attracted to? Positive charge. So where's the positive charge on the other molecule? The carbonyl carbon, right. So if you put a, if you use a deprotonated acid as a nucleophile with an acid chloride, just like we had up above, the leaving group is the chlorine. And the nucleophile lines up attached. So we're going to make an acid anhydride in this case. So our final product here, it's going to be the acid anhydride where you wind up replacing this chlorine group with this whole molecule here. So after step two here, get that molecule. 
So step one was taking the ester and converting it to the acid. Step two was taking an acid chloride and turning it into an acid anhydride. Right, so with these acid derivatives, almost all of your reactions are going to be either a reduction because it can't be oxidized any further without just turning it to CO2. So either it's gonna be a reduction, and those should be pretty easy to recognize based on what our reactants are, if it's a hydride source or a carbon source. And if it's not one of those, then it's a reaction that's going to convert back and forth between the various forms of, of the acid derivatives. So an acid can be turned into an acid chloride. An acid chloride can be turned into an acid anhydride. An amide can be turned into a nitrile. That's when we just added. And again, we'll spend more time with that in a second. But your, your go-to logic when you're looking for these should be, okay, if I have an acid derivative and I have a nucleophile, that nucleophile is going to get attached to that carbonyl somehow. And either you're going to reduce the, the acid derivative or you're converting it to a different acid derivative. I'm sure you didn't ask anything out of order this time. Yeah, these all seem fine. All right, let's try these. So with that in mind, they're all either converting to another acid derivative or you are going to reduce them. Yeah, so the diisobutyl aluminum hydride is one we haven't seen before, but that's just, it's just one of those hydride sources that only goes one step. So we're going to turn the ester into an aldehyde instead of taking it all the way to an alcohol. and then technically plus methanol. So for the second one, it's not a reduction. You have an anhydride and you have an alcohol. So your alcohol is gonna act as your nucleophile. And really remember it would go in two steps where you make that tetrahedral intermediate, but for the sake of just showing this and not having to redraw the whole thing, um, you can show them as, at, as one step for the sake of just getting the product. So acid anhydride, when exposed to a nucleophile, the nucleophile replaces 
the chunk that can leave as the deprotonated acid. So for G, what's our leaving group and what functional, what are we going to end up with as our functional group? Our leaving group is the chloride. We're replacing that with the nitrogen. So it's all just identify your nucleophile, identify what the nucleophile's target is. So then what are we going to get for H? Salicylic acid. acid. Our leaving group is attached to the same molecule, but it's still the leaving group. So we're going to chop off the oxygen here, which turns into an alcohol, and we're going to replace it with water acting as our nucleophile, packing a carbonyl. Speaking of salicylic acid, on the the midterms that are created but forgotten at home, um, the um, the acidity question that was a bit of a trick question. I was expecting salicylic acid to be less acidic than benzoic acid um, because it has an a um, electron donating group attached to the benzene ring, but the Funny thing about resonance is sometimes it doesn't always behave as, as predictably as induction. Um, and so it actually was more acidic. So if you mixed up one and two, I think you got it right but for the wrong reason. It, um, and I got it wrong for what I did to be the right reason when I was writing E, but nobody got marked down any points if you mixed up one and two <coughs> on that particular problem. Might have, uh, I might have had that like on my cheat sheet where salicylic acid is, is more acidic. Yeah. So you got it right for the right reason then. Um, just by like, 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 <laughs> Yeah, counterintuitive to the, the way we were thinking about it before we started um, because I asked you examples of resonance instead of just going with straight induction. Um, so, but that's. Neither here nor there. We'll go over the tests and I'll have them for you on Tuesday. I just left the house in a hurry this morning for out my bed. All right. So let's talk about amides a little bit. So amides in general are the least reactive of the 
um, or this is nitriles. I lost the slide somewhere. Hang on, let me go back to Dropbox real quick. Let's do amides first. Um, amides in general are the least reactive of any of the um, acid derivatives. So basically anything that where you, you can make an amide from lots of things, but it's a lot harder this is the slide that was missing. Um, it's a lot harder to make an amide do something else. So acid chlorides can make amides pretty easily. You get good yields with it. Um, and you can take an amide and when exposing it to water and acid and heat, you can get it to go back the other way to make the acid, but you don't generally get great yields when you do this, unless you have some way of removing the, the product as it's forming, or you just you know lean on the stoichiometry um, and Le Chatelier's to, to push it. Um, once you make an amide though, it could be pretty useful in terms of this is the way of kind of getting rid of the acid derivative character. So you can you can get rid of an acid derivative by just turning it by exposing it to a hydride source. Um, but, but if you expose an amide to a hydrogen source, the oxygen is a better leaving group than the nitrogen. So instead of winding up with the alcohol, you wind up making um, you wind up making an amide. You just remove that carbonyl and just turn it into a nitrogen there. And so all of the different acid derivatives can make amides pretty easily, although acid chlorides give us the best yield. And so typically the way, the way we see that is in that, that first page of reactions that we were looking at, where we started by taking an acid and turning it into the acid chloride. And then we take the acid chloride and expose it to an amine to make the amide product just with the best yield. You can turn it into something that's the most reactive and then expose it to the other, the other reactive, the other nucleophile, you're gonna get better yields than if you just went to try to go straight from the acid to the amide. It's doable, but again, if we're trying to maximize our yields, you actually get better yields by doing it in two steps. Um, which is, is one of those things you wouldn't necessarily expect until you've done it and checked the numbers. Um, you tried it both ways, just as the acid exposed to the amine versus converting the acid to the acid chloride and then exposing it to the amine. If you take an amide, so, Amides can get converted to nitriles as well by, by exposing them to SOCl2. Because remember that the SOCl2 makes the oxygen a better leaving group. The sulfur preferentially burns bonds with the oxygen to make a sulfur oxygen bond that's really stable. Um, and it does that instead of bonding with the nitrogen. So instead of getting with the SOCl2 when it was, he's not using power tools now. Um, when the SOCl2 was exposed to an acid, you wind up effectively taking the carbonyl oxygen and removing it and replacing it with a chloride. And so you get the acid chloride. If you do the same thing to an amide, you get a nitride. So amides are helpful and somewhat unique in the acid derivatives category in that having the nitrogen attached, which all of a sudden the oxygen is a better leaving group than the nitrogen, allows us to go a couple different directions that we can't with the other acid derivatives. Um, the other way that you can make a nitrile is actually just with an SN2, because remember cyanide is a pretty good nucleophile. 
the difference between these two methods is that this that reaction one up here that adds a carbon because you have carbon acting as a nucleophile in the form of cyanide. So you actually gain a carbon by doing it that way versus if you dehydrate an amide, you keep all the same carbons. You just took one of the acid derivative carbon, the carbonyl carbon, and converted it to that nitrile group. Right, so in terms of synthesis, we have to pay attention to that. And in terms of you know, molecular formulas and stuff, because it'd be pretty easy um, to not realize if, you know, why would we even bother dehydrating an amide when, when we could just use cyanide as a nucleophile? Well, one, cyanide is pretty nasty to work with um, as far as health concerns. Um, there's a reason it's the primary means of poisoning people in all the old Agatha Christie's um, because it's really good at poisoning people. It's not the best to work with. Um, if you ever smell almonds in a chemistry lab, get away immediately, seek fresh air because very faint, very small amounts of cyanide as a gas smell like almonds. Um, and it's poisonous, deadly at fairly low concentrations. So that's like, that's one of those things where that's a, a, you know, canary in a coal mine sort of situation. You smell almonds, get out and then figure out what happened once you're in fresh air. Um, so with that in mind, you don't always want to work with cyanide. So making a nitrile by starting from the amide is a lot safer in a lot of respects as well. And plus, we can, if we already have the carbon structure we want, a lot of times then uh, going from the amide is a better option. Uh, so this bottom part is just the, is the mechanism for turning the amide into a nitrile. And it works at the same first step as turning an acid into an acid chloride. Um, and that's the, the oxygen pi bond bonds with the sulfur. Then you end up making this oxide like uh, intermediate where you have the nitrogen double bond to the carbon with the oxygen still attached. And go through the same thing we saw before where it rearranges itself to make this really good leaving group. This SO2Cl is once again a really good leaving group. So then it's just a matter of a couple of proton transfers. And you wind up with that leaving group leaving and making that nitrile, that carbon triple bonded to a nitrogen. So the, the real key here is just like before, it's that seeing that first step and recognizing that this is a really good leaving group. And then it's just sort of cleaning up what happens after that. If you know that it's going to wind up as the nitrile, it's pretty easy to see how how a couple of proton transfers, you just deprotonate that nitrogen a few times and your leaving group leaves. And that gets you to the nitrile. So now that we've made a nitrile, there are a few reactions that we get that are specific to nitriles. Um, one is that well, you can actually go back to, to the amine or the amide, excuse me. So that so making the nitrile is actually a reversible reaction. You expose an amide to SO, SOCl2 to make the nitrile. You then take the nitrile and you just expose it to um, acid and heat. You go back to making the amide, which seems problematic given that we make we make um protective gloves out of nitrile um seems like they might not hold up all that well to to acid and heat except that there's one of two things that, that's happening either the process of taking a nitrile and turning it to a polymer means we don't actually have a nitrile group anymore 
so it won't go through this reaction anymore, um, which is probably the way the way it actually works. A lot of times, the what they the way you name a polymer is you name it based on what the monomer was, not what the new molecule looks like. Um, so it's, that's one option. One of the reasons that it might might still work. The other reason is that. Um, even if you do still have a nitrile group, it's probably not what's holding the polymer together. There might be another functional group that's actually making the plastic polymers, and the nitrile is just just gives it some sort of um, hydrophobic character or some sort of character that where it's advantageous um, in terms of making the gloves. Um, so it's it's not likely that we actually are going to wind up with those gloves falling apart. If you take those nitrile gloves and you put them in acid with heat, you're probably not going to wind up with them falling apart necessarily. Um, if that if it was that easy to break them back down, then we'd recycle them um, and we turn them back into monomers again. Um, in this case, we wait the amide and then the amide itself can then go through hydrolysis again to get all the way back to the acid. So we actually, once again, this is a fairly reversible process. And you can do it when it's catalyzed by a base or an acid, just like with all these others, right? If under basic conditions, you wind up with a nucleophile replacing a leaving group. Under acidic conditions, you wind up with a nucleophile replacing a and leaving group. Um, if you expose a nitrile to a Grignard reagent, it behaves more or less like you would expect. Um, you wind up making the dispian imine, a primary imine. Um, you wind up with your R group attacking the carbon or the nitrile carbon to make a carbon double bonded to a nitrogen. Which, if there was an R group attached, we'd call it an imine. I'm not sure if this is an imine or not. It might be. That would probably have an oxygen involved. I'll look up and see if this is considered an imine during our break. Um, but then the nice thing about that is it does, regardless of whatever this functional group is, we know that a carbon double bonded to a nitrogen, when exposed to oxygen, will convert back to being a carbonyl. So this gives us a way to um, attach a single R group to our carbonyl carbon, what was our carbonyl carbon. And so this is, this is another route we have of, of doing a selective reduction. We took it from being an acid derivative to being a carbonyl, but it's a class two carbonyl now. Now we made a ketone out of it instead of making a um, take, reducing it all the way to the alcohol. Um, and again, this is one of those things where, depending on where you're starting and where you're trying to go and what the exact yields are, you might go one route versus another. There's definitely two routes to get to a carbonyl or a um, acid derivative into a ketone. But you can also use those Gilman reagents we talked about, the like Grignard reagents, but but uh, more selective, but those might not have very good yields. So depending on your exact situation, it might actually be more economical to go through this multi-step, take your acid, turn it to a nitrile, take the nitrile, expose it to a Grignard reagent, and then turn the Grignard, the um, resulting imine, and turn it back to the carbonyl. Uh, it looks like more steps. It is more steps, but it's, it's possible that you would get better yields that way because those Gilman reagents just don't have great yields. They're not nearly as reactive as as some um, Grignard reagents. And then, last but not least, and then we'll take a break. If you expose an nitrile to lithium aluminum hydride, you get the just like with the amide, with the amide, when you expose it to lithium aluminum hydride, you got the amine as your product because the oxygen was the better leaving group. The oxygen's already left in this case. So this behaves just the same way as the amide 
does. When you have a nitrogen attached to a carbon and you expose it to lithium aluminum hydride, instead of ending at the alcohol, you end up at the amine. And you just break those extra carbon to something more electronegative bonds and you wind up with the amine product. And this one is not one that you can do um, selectively. Um, at least not predictably that you could probably try using some of those other like more selective, less reactive hydride sources um, to get to get this reaction to happen one step. Um, but it's, again, it's not, not in a predictable way. It would be on a case by case basis. You might try it to see what happens. If you've got the, the product you want in any sort of reasonable amount. Um, but in general, nitriles only get fully reduced by lithium aluminum hydride. But with Grignard reagents, they are selectively reduced. All right, let's take a break. Let's come back at five after. Everybody can go pound on the book, bookstore door and tell them to warm up the, the curing. Oh yeah, you have a, you have a deadline, huh? Two hours later. That's that's in that, that no man's land where it's like two hours. Uh, that's enough. I should probably sleep a little bit, but where it's tempting to just like, uh, I might just actually feel better if I just don't. Yeah, no, it's, it's I'm on a, I'm on a two hour website in college. I don't know if it's like total like placebo psychological effect, but it's called Sleepy Time. So it's like sleepy ti dot me. And it'll tell you like based on like the average time that a sleep cycle is, if, if you're like going to bed right now, it tells you what time you should set your alarm for to avoid waking up in the middle of a sleep cycle. And I actually feel better and again, it could be total like for bullshit, but I do feel better when I like wake up at the time it tells me to. Yeah. There's there's something to that because I I've noticed that too. Yeah. Um, like if I get four hours of sleep, I feel better than if I get five hours of sleep or yeah. six hours of sleep. If yeah. I can hit that sleep cycle right, where I'm because because I naturally wake up in the middle of the night anyway, because I get eight, eight hour of sleep. Schedule is two sleep cycles usually. Yeah. I wake up in between mine all the time anyway. And if I happen to be off enough, like if I'm going to get six hours of sleep and I wake up at four in the morning, I will have a better day if I just get up at four in the morning rather than yeah. go back to sleep for two hours and then have to get up in the middle of the sleep yeah. cycle. I love. I mean, it, it's like it looks exactly the same as it did when I first started using it like 15 years ago. But it's like it. I think there's something to it. I don't disagree. And you can either choose, like, I, I'm going to sleep right now, what should I wake up, or I need to wake up at this time, what time should I go to sleep? Like, it'll tell you mm -hmm. either way. I don't know. Who knows if it is? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I like this one here on the table. I saw the same one on me where the halogens are labeled good leaving groups. <laughs> but otherwise, <laughs> it's like all the same stuff. Yeah. Very good. America, named after smart guys. That's funny. Have you seen there was like on, online, there was this uh, like map of the US with the states labeled by like a German guy? I have seen that <laughs> it's one. It's like, is this Ohio? Wait, this is definitely Ohio. <laughs> well, New England is just all like, what's going on here? This, yeah. <laughs> Stop. Stop. It's funny too, the, um, the way that uh, growing up in different parts of the country, when you learn your, your geography, you learn it very differently. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, Laura being from Minnesota, she sees that all of the states that are in, in a line there 
look like if you put them all together, starting with Louisiana as the boots and Minnesota as the chef's hat. Um, it's a straight line uh, that makes a figure. And, and he's holding a frying pan and that is Tennessee and Kentucky is the chicken in the frying pan. Like, I never I never learned that. that. That's I never I, I feel like I would know. Right. Yeah, and so I'm always like, wait, which one is first? Is it Iowa and then Missouri? And she goes, well, Missouri is the pants. Iowa is the shirt. <laughs> wait, what? I wish I would have learned it like that. Because it's true. I look at the Midwest, and I'm just like, ah, I have no idea what's what. Yeah. Oh, I was the head. Missouri is the shirt. Arkansas is the pants. Louisiana is the boots. I see it. And then you got Tennessee is the frying pan and Kentucky is the chicken, which makes sense. Kentucky fried chicken. And right. it does, Kentucky does look like a chicken drumstick, like a yeah. fried chicken drumstick. Holy smokes, I wish I would have learned this. Right? I love that. Like yeah, for sure. I, it's, I think it's it's uh, a relic of the fact that we grew up in states that are easy to recognize. Mm -hmm. Like everybody knows where Florida is, everybody yeah. knows where California is. Yeah, but the stuff in the middle is just like, ugh. No. Yeah. Places nobody wants to go. Yeah. <laughs> the flyovers. Right. <laughs> That's so bad. Although I will say, I. Driving across, so I've driven from to Minnesota, starting starting from Washington, starting from Tahoe, starting from Southern California, and starting from Phoenix. Mm -hmm. And you get very different trips. Yeah. Um, when you do that, um, the one starting from Phoenix, uh, and we went across New Mexico, and then caught the top of Texas and the Panhandle of Oklahoma, and then Kansas. Southern Kansas is actually really pretty. Yeah. You wouldn't know it to drive through all the cornfields like, up north. Kansas sucks to drive through. It's right. forever. <laughs> and there's like nothing if you're not in Yeah, that. exactly. Um, yeah. But it, uh, it actually is kind of, well, and then sometimes you see stuff that you recognize from Oregon Trail, like when you drive through Nebraska, we, yeah. um, on, I think it's just on I-80, but you can see, if you look really closely, you can see Chimney Rock um, off to the right or off to the south. Um, yeah. I remember stopping at Chimney Rock in Oregon yeah, Trail. Oregon Trail. Right. That was like the last good place to get supplies before like, everybody started dying from dysentery. Yeah. Well, I've done like both of the more southern route, like going through Kansas and mm -hmm. then going more and more um, through South Dakota. Oh, okay. To get like cross country. Yeah. South Dakota is okay. It's boring, but it's you boring. Look All you see is wall drug signs. Yeah. So, like, have you ever stopped? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was like, I can't not stop. There's right. too many. It's actually like for a tourist trap, there's a lot there. Like, it is. It, it is. was pretty well staffed when you were there. I don't know how COVID might have uh, impacted it. I but. think we stopped at Waldrog post COVID and during the summer, last summer, we stopped yeah. at Waldrog. Well, so many people are camping now, got RVs, but I bet it is like probably even better than before. That way. Yeah, it was it was still pretty busy. I wonder, let's see when we came back. When we came back, it was during Sturgis, and so we just stayed away uh, from all that. Other than we went to the um, Devil's Tower in Wyoming. Oh yeah, that's um, like isn't that eerie? It is. I like something about that place. We were quiet, and I saw it in the distance. Like I don't feel right. <laughs> like, I don't know what it is. I think it's a holdover from. Um, did you ever watch Close Encounters the third kind? Yes, a long time ago. So that's it's probably why it's so, you know, because yeah, it's kind of such a big part of that movie. Yeah, it, it is. It's like it's really cool, but it's like very just kind of creepy for some reason. Well, the I, we read about the um the Native American stories about it, and it was like there were there were two children, a boy and a girl, that were being protected by one of the gods, but in 
they're being chased by one of the other gods who was in the form of a giant bear. And so the, the god that was helping them like raised up the, the platform so the bear couldn't get to them. And so which the marks you see on the side of the bear's claws. Oh, wow. And so that's kind of that's kind of fun too. That's like a oh that yeah, of course geologically that's yeah. not accurate, of course, but yeah. it's still like a fun story. And it's like we we like to do like random stuff like that, even if it's just driving out of the way. We didn't even get have you car. stopped at in Mitchell, South Dakota, the corn oh, palace. Oh yeah. No, we know the corn palace. Oh, I love that place. I thought it was so well done. Like for it is. And we also went to, um, I think it was in Minnesota, the Spam Museum. I don't think I've been to the Spam Museum. That was, let me see where it is. That museum, that's like probably one of the best museums out there. Really? Yes, I was very surprised. It's in Austin, Minnesota. Austin, Minnesota. It's okay. definitely worth a stop. Like, and, okay. and there's a restaurant across the street that like specializes in Spam dishes. Like I, I like Spam eggs. I really like salty things. So. Oh yeah, we, I'm a big fan of Spam. My kids, my kids love. Um, in, oh, it's by Albert Lee. Okay. But yeah, um, it's, it was a really, really cool museum. That one, and that one wouldn't even be out that out of the way. And actually, we may have driven through. So my brother-in-law lives in Rochester. Okay. Um. And we left from Rochester to drive back before. Mm -hmm. So we probably drove through Austin yeah, to get to Albert Lee. It's totally worth a stop. It is okay. like very cool. And I think kids would like it too. They had like enough little of like the exhibits for kids. My my kids love salt bombs. Um, yes. and like they they love sushi. Their favorite food of all time is sushi. Yeah. And so during COVID, when that was not really an option because nobody knew like could you get it from eating raw fish? Yeah. Like, and we made sushi at home, and to we made it, we made spam sushi, Hawaiian sushi, um, that was really, really tasty. Yeah, like the musubi. Yeah, 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 yeah. Soak your spam in soy sauce and then fry it up. Yes. Oh, Take your salt and add some more salt to it. Oh, that sounds good to me. Uh, it was, it was pretty tasty. Yeah. So they, they probably did okay. that. It was, it was really cool. I was surprised. The Decor Palace, I just thought, was like really neat. Like, who, who came up with this idea? Like, hearing like John Philip Sousa played at the <laughs> Corn Palace, like, what? <laughs> well, it, it, when you go inside, too, and it's all the, um, it's, the, it's the town's like high school basketball court and yes. stuff like that. So it's like, it's like such it's, a source of pride for them. Yeah. Yeah. So we're I, talking about the Corn Palace in Mitchell, South Dakota. It's, yeah. it's unique. It's like my favorite magnet that I have. I collect magnets and ornaments when I travel. And uh, the corn palace is really great. And that, that slogan just makes me want to open a, a corn palace of my own. World's <laughs> only corn palace. But yeah, they have. But that, those designs on the outside are made totally out of corn. dried corn. Yeah, yeah, different varieties. Anyway. Um, Talking about places to stop that and wall drug. Wall drug is really entertaining. Is that one in, is that North Dakota or South Dakota? I'm pretty sure it's South Dakota. Yeah, is it on, it must be on 90. Yeah. All right. Yeah, Wall, South Dakota. Yeah, the town of Wall. Yeah. You have like a fridge covered in that. I well, my fridge isn't magnetic anymore, so my husband gave me this like big frame that has like a magnetic card, so I put them all in there. It's a good idea. Yeah. We're the same. At least half of our fridge is exposed, and that's why it's still magnetic. Yeah. All right. Let's. So this is the mechanism for hydrolysis of nitriles. This is the acid catalyzed version because uh, if we've learned anything about acid catalyzed versus um, base catalyzed, the base catalyzed ones are always simpler. Same intermediates almost, but without um, just different charges. Um, and so this and this is going to go through a similar sort of intermediate to what we saw before, where if you start by turning that triple bond into a double bond. By protonating the nitrogen and then having your oxygen act as a nucleophile to attack 
the carbon and you wind up with almost this, it's like a, an inverse amide. Um, which actually is that, that one might actually be an oxide. Hang on. I'm not autocomplete. So an oxide has the oxygen attached to the nitrogen. So let's try Molby real quick. So when you wind up with that sort of inverse amide where the nitrogen has the double bond and the oxygen has the single bond. it actually just automatically turns it back into being the amide because it's just going to be, it's like a tautomerization, right? The carbon oxygen double bond is more stable than the carbon nitrogen double bond. Um, and that, that just comes about as a result of the fact that the oxygen is more electronegative, right? So the, the, and the carbon is the bully in this case. So in this case, it's two bullies fighting over um, who gets to pick on carbon. Oxygen is the stronger of the two bullies, so it gets to pick on carbon more. Um, so once you get this inverse amide, bizarro amide, that's what we're calling it. That's the official name now, bizarro amide. Um, the bizarro amide tautomerizes, and you just wind up protonating the nitrogen, making um, a resonant structure where you, one of the resonant structures is the carbonyl, and then you just deprotonate that oxygen there. Maybe we call it an omi instead of an amide. The O mean. All right, so let's just go through some practice. We'll do some react some um, reaction series as well. So it does appear that a nitrogen double bond into a carbon is, is an imine, regardless of whether or not there's an R attached. Mm -hmm. 
not seeing anything else about the bizarro of my other than it's close to being a carbonate. All right. So if we take an amide and we're going to reduce it, lithium aluminum hydroxide, the oxygen is the better leaving group than the nitrogen. So this goes away, just gets replaced with two hydride bonds. And you leave the nitrogen alone. Take an acid chloride, expose it to an amine or ammonia. You're just replacing the good leaving group with the nitrogen. So you make the amide. You take the amide and you expose it to acid and heat. You undo the formation of the amide. Of the amide, you're going to get a mixture. Actually, in this case, yeah, you're going to getting a mixture of the amide and the acid. But as far as drawing a product, and you know, so realistically, that should be an equilibrium reaction because you're just going to make some of the amide of the ammonia. So, and that can spontaneously react backwards as well. If you wanted to make sure it didn't react backwards, what could you do? For it to react backwards, the nitrogen would have to act as a nucleophile, right? If you don't want the nitrogen to be able to act as a nucleophile, what could you do? You make it more acidic, protonate that, that nitrogen so that it doesn't have a lone pair. So you make it acidic enough and you're gonna favor the forward reaction because it can't react backwards. It's still gonna be an equilibrium reaction, um, but you can get it to favor the forward part of the equilibrium reaction even more by playing with the pH that way. If we have a cyanide, cyanide group, a nitrile group, when you're naming that as a prefix, it's a cyano group. Um, they reduce more or less the same way as the amides. You don't have the nitrogen or the oxygen as a leaving group. So you're going to take that cyano group. And reduce it to being the ammonia, or sorry, the uh, amine. Just remember that that CN that you're reducing is a carbon. So, and it's linear when it's when it's triple bond bonded to the nitrogen. So it looks like I had randomly added a carbon, but I didn't. You just have to remember that the functional group that you started with has the carbon in it. So it's just a, that's just a bookkeeping, it takes practice and, and remember with those cyano groups. Um, it's just like with the acetylides, it's easy to forget that there's two carbons there or one carbon in this case. For B, 
if we have cyano group acting as a nucleophile, we're just going to start by replacing bromine, which is the good leaving group, with the cyano group. Then we expose to methyl magnesium bromide, so Grignard reagent, and then acid. So the Grignard reagent is going to take the cyano group and turn it into a imine. Are you broke all? So we get this as our intermediate and whatever is attached to the Grignard reagent. Um, whatever the carbon is from our Grignard reagent gets added to that. Oh, see, I just did it. I lost track of how many carbons I had, didn't I? So it's probably a good habit to be in to write out that nitrile group because that's the carbon. Did I know or did I remember? Did I get it right? I don't know. We'll never know. I erased it. So when you add the Grignard reagent, it goes on to this carbon. And our nitrogen is attached there. And then exposing it to the water. What's that? Okay. Either way, I confused myself. And so it's easy to do with these cyano groups. So be careful. And like I said, it's probably a good habit to just have it explicitly written out so that you remember that that carbon is a carbon. Um, once you have the imine and you expose it to acid, it's just going to rearrange itself. And imines, when they go through the hydrolysis that we that we learned about last chapter, um, you just turn it back to being carbonyl. Which is that benzophenol? I know this one has a common name. No, not quite. One carbon, two carbons, there's going to be our carbonyl. That's the wrong one. That is phenylacetone, of course. Yeah, exactly. Phenyl acetone, because if you take phenyl acetone and you turn that oxygen into an amine, um, then you wind up with amphetamine. And if you turn it into an, a secondary amine by using um, methylamine as your nucleophile, then you wind up with methamphetamine. So it's the, uh, so I was a little confused by the diagram. Mm -hmm. It seems like you also form the amine of the Grignard. Or so like in this case, that will mean? Right. No, because you're not losing the, the nitrogen. The nitrogen's staying attached. You don't have the nitrogen the leaving group, so you don't wind up with that acting as, a, as something getting in the way. At least not significantly so. It was like, it shows the uh, R group adding to the nitrile. 
If you have an R group attached to the to the nitrogen. Oh. So if you made the imine that had an R group attached, but you won't as a cyan cyano group. You will see that though if you make if you started from the ketone. Is it no one of the reaction summaries? Yeah. No, that's a typo. Because you have two R groups here and you still have the two R groups here. So maybe I just took this, maybe I copied one of the figures from, from the other chapter that had an R group attached to the amine. Um, but you, and you pretty much never see a nitrile with an R group attached to the nitrogen. Right. Yeah, that it should just be NH three. And I'll double check that though too. It could be some sort of weird sort of geometry thing where as the nitrogen leaves, but you would think the, the acid is going to ruin the, any leftover green yard reagent before the nitrogen even has a chance to leave, one would think. Yeah, it just has it going to adding one of the R groups doesn't say, look like there's anything with stoichiometry. So that's just a typo. Either on my part or the book's part. Here's where we are. All right, let's do an even longer one. So start with ethyl magnesium bromide followed by the acid with your nitrile. So after steps one and two, steps one and two are the same thing we just did before. We wind up with the adding an ethyl group to your nitrile to make the imine. And then the imine hydrolyzes to make the carbonyl. So we get a ketone. And then the ketone is exposed to lithium aluminum hydride which is just going to reduce it. And that last step, the, the water, this is really, really only two steps. It's written as four steps because these two reactions we're doing are each two step reactions. You need a green yard reagent followed by H3O plus. Then you need the lithium aluminum hydride followed by the water. And the water is just going to act as a proton source. So 
So there's our final answer for C. And again, as um, I was mentioning for the for the recording and for the earliest risers here, um, the if you can't get the mechanism all the way right, at least give me the intermediates on the test. Because even if you can't draw the arrows properly, if you can get all the right intermediates, I can still give you most of the credit. Um, and I realize that if you can draw the intermediates, you probably are not that far from being able to draw the, the arrows anyway. But push comes to shove, if you can only get one of the intermediates, get that intermediate in there. One that might jog some things loose as far as what the other steps look like, but at the very least, um, give me something that I can get, give some partial credit for. Because even if, if I ask for the mechanism for this whole pro process, and instead of drawing mechanism, you just drew what we have written here, that's still a, probably, you know, a six out of six, maybe a seven out of 10. Um, just because you know the steps, even if you can't show where the electrons are going necessarily. Okay, so those are helpful in a variety of ways to be able to draw those intermediates. Okay. If we just have a cyano group, and we add acid and heat, it does the same thing as the amide. You start by turning it back to being an amide, and then you can wind up with the amide hydrolyzing back to the acid. So again, not great yields necessarily. But you start by turning this into our bizarro amide, bizarro amide, which can then rearrange to make the primary universe amide. which can then hydrolyze further and again this is it's really only possible because um, we live in a water water centric civilization planet species um, because all of our solutions are made out of water, basically as you wind up producing ammonia as your byproduct, it's gonna be in such small amounts and it's going to rapidly evaporate off if we're doing this in a water-based solution, the ammonia is going to evaporate off and as it does so drives equilibrium forward. If we were trying to do this reaction in ammonia as our solvent, this wouldn't work because we would be starting from a from having water dissolved in ammonia instead of ammonia dissolved in water, right? And so that switches everything in terms of the equilibrium in the Chatelier's here. Um, so it's because the nitrile is less reactive. The nitrogen is a worse leaving group. And the oxygen, like we've talk, said this whole time, the only reason this happens is because of the Chateliers and just really high concentrations of water if, when you're in a water-based solution. I don't actually know what the molarity of liquid ammonia is, but the molarity of water in itself is about 55 moles per liter, which is really high compared to most of these concentrations we're dealing with, right? And ammonia is probably something similar, because I know it's got a similar density to water. 
um, and it's got a similar molecular weight. So one would expect that ammonia is got a really high, um, really high concentration molarity in itself as well. But we don't do this in liquid ammonia. Go for it. You, you might that might not be an easy one to uh, to find. You might have to look up density of ammonia and use. I was just going to look up yeah. density of ammonia. Seven. Yeah. Oh, it is significantly less. So 0.73, so looking at like 40, 45 molar. So that would be one way you could get this reaction to easily go back the other way is to do this in liquid ammonia. Um, which is the definition of, of excess, right? You're really pushing on the equilibrium. Never thought to look up the molar water. It's just five point five. It so from because from that you can get to a lot of like KA and KB of water and things like that. I don't remember why I first remembered look, calculating that. But one of my early chemistry classes, we did that for some reason to make a point about equilibrium or it's probably just, I think we had to do it to show that it was water wasn't the limiting reactant in a in a precipitation reaction or something like that. Not precipitation, but in an acid base reaction. If I'm remembering correctly. Um, there is some pedagogical reason why I had to I had to calculate the molarity of water in itself. All right, so this complicated figure is a synthesis figure. Um, I've got a way now. Um, Basically, this is just all the different ways you can convert back and forth between the various acid derivatives. The section in the middle is probably the most critical because it's arranged from most reactive to least reactive. And really the acid and the ester are roughly in the same level of reactivity and they both have oxygen acting as the leaving group. Um, and so this, the section that I had circled first is really straightforward. Most reactive can go to the next most reactive, can go to the next most reactive and, and so on down the line. So this has that this contains within it all of that information as about as far as reactivity goes, um, and you'll notice that the um, it's harder to go from right to left. There are fewer options to go from right to left. If you want to go from right to left, you basically have to get to the acid. And then from the acid, you can go to the acid chloride, and then you can get to any of the others again, right? So you can do this re repeatedly as many times as you wanted, really. But if you're trying to get from, say, the acid anhydride to the acid chloride, you can't just go one step backwards. You have to go to the acid. And then from the acid to the acid chloride, because that's really our only good way of getting all the way uphill. You can think, here's a good analogy. Um, SOCl2 plus the acid is like your ski lift. Take your ski lift, you're going all the way to the top of the mountain, and then you can get to anywhere from there. 
get to the acid chloride first, and then you can get anywhere else along here with pretty decent yields because it's so reactive. But sometimes you have to take that hat track over to the bottom of the lift that goes where you want it to go, right? You have to take something that seems like a lateral move or like it's going opposite of where you want to go, but that gets you to the bottom of the ski lift. And then you can get to the top of the ski lift and go anywhere else you want, for instance. So that's our, our chairlift, that reaction right there. Um, and there's a couple, so everything above this line, I've never found one of these synthesis charts that has everything on it because they're always going to be focused on one thing in particular or they don't have enough detail. Um, everything above this line, the carbon has the same oxidation state. So those are all the acid derivatives. Everything lower, the oxygen or the carbon has been reduced. So here's our class two carbonyl. And then you've got your, your carbon almost fully reduced at the very bottom, right? But you can kind of categorize those in terms of like by oxidation state, as far as remember. And then because once we got to the alcohol, there's a whole nother mess of reactions that have to do with alcohols, right? So, and there's a whole mess of reactions that have to do with aldehydes and ketones. So this is far from comprehensive. This is just the, a good way of arranging how we think about the acid derivatives and how we then get to other, other subway hubs, if you will, or other gondolas. So let's practice getting around the mountain allegorically. What reagents will we use? What reactions do we have to use to get from a methyl ester to the acid chloride? I'll give you all a few minutes to work on these.
all it can find on this functional group to be inverse amide is that if it's protonated with a positive charge on the nitrogen, it's referred to as the conjugate acid of an amide. All right, so for A, what are we looking at? You want to make an acid chloride, right? That's the top of the mountain. Only one way to get there. And that's our chairlift, right? Which means we have to make this into the acid first. Luckily, that's an easy. You just need to go through that saponification. That gets us to the acid. And then we need good old thionyl chloride. What do we have to do for B? Yeah, if we, we, if we make it to the amide, this is one where thinking backwards can work, can help, right? Because there's only two ways we can get to the amide from either from the amide, or sorry, to the amine, from the amide or from the nitrile. So there are actually two options in this case, because you could take the, the acid and you could convert it to the nitrile, um, which, acid to the nitrile it's not going to give great yields though directly but we could go from the acid up the chairlift excess ammonia then reduce it You could, you could get decent yields if you skip step one and you just did excess ammonia with the, with the acid. But again, you're fighting against equilibrium because this has going to be done in a, in a water-based environment. If you did it with, if you did this in a polar aprotic solvent, you might be able to get better yields that way, but it's probably easier to just use the thionyl chloride, make the acid chloride and go that route. To keep going with the with the ski hill analogy, trying to go straight from here to the MI, it's like taking that cat track all the way across the mountain. When you could just go the other way, get to the top, and then ski down. Both faster and more fun, and more sure that you're going to get where you're trying to go. If we want to go from the acid anhydride to the acid chloride, just like with A, start by hydrolyzing it, turning it into the acid. Followed up with SOCl2. I was thinking maybe it's possible to use a second chloride pile with So potentially the problem is you need to make the, the acid group an even better leaving group, or you need, you need to make chloride the chloride a better nucleophile. So you could do it with something like a Lewis base of some sort. To, to make the chloride an even better nucleophile than normal, but it's already such a good leaving group that have, you'd be fighting against the equilibrium the whole way. Um, so going, and in theory, 
I'm actually, I actually don't know what it would do if you just took the acid anhydride and you exposed it to dimethyl chloride. If you tried to just do that all in one step, but I have a feeling you're going to get some side reactions happening and you'd be better off usually, especially when it's a symmetric anhydride, because you can actually double your yield if you, if you go to the acid because you make two moles of that acid then. Um, versus cutting your potential yield in half by trying to go direct, you know, exactly backwards. I don't know if they're taking that into account by not allowing us to do that, or you get other weird stuff going on, and then you know, and lowering your yield that way. Um, if we want to go from the ester to the amine. Well, that's really the same as B, isn't it? Just with one step at the beginning. Didn't B have like three different pathways that you could go down? You could. So to get to to get to the amine, you need to get to one of these two. And to get to those from the acid. So you could take the acid convert it to the ester, expose it to excess ammonia to get here, and then go there. But if you're going, if you're already at the acid, it kind of makes more sense to go all the way to the thionyl, to the acid chloride, because then you've got something that's really reactive and will react really predictably. If you're starting from the ester, though, that might that's two extra steps. Then you have to hydrolyze the ester to get the acid, and then take the acid to the acid chloride, and then take the acid chloride to the amide, and then take the amide to the amine. So for this second one, rather than make it a four-step process, it might be easier to take the cap track over, and because because we're not doing this in um, the fact that we have water present is not going to throw everything off like it did. You're starting as the acid. We start as the ester and just expose it to two equivalents of ammonia. You can make the amide because you're not fighting with such high concentrations of another nucleophile. So in this case, you could just go ester expose it to ammonia to make the amide expose the amide uh, and then use lithium aluminum hydride to get it reduced or you could go an extra step clear this all off since we're starting here and we're trying to get here you could go one two three, four, but you probably get similar yields in only two steps if you just went one, two. Right. And again, the reason that you, they don't show you doing that for the acid is because you're fighting with water the whole way then. All right. You better finish it up there and oh, that's what happened. This slide got dragged to the very end somehow. When I was off at the beginning and I couldn't figure out what was going on. I managed to put that at the end. Um, we'll just call this, this will be the quiz this weekend. Um, be these three synthesis problems, and then we'll go over them at the beginning of class on Tuesday along with the test. Um, and I'll put them, I'll put them on the uh, quiz as well, but it's just going to be these three problems. So 